This is the Dairy Brothers Tribecast, a podcast for diehard Cleveland Indians fans. Presented to you by WaitingForNextYear.com. Now, here are the hosts, Matt and Todd Derry. All right, here we go. Another edition of the Dairy Brothers Tribecast. It is indeed a Monday morning, a day off for the Indians, following another up and down week, mostly down. Boy, some bad baseball being played this week in Chicago as the Indians drop three out of four to the White Sox. Yes, you could even say it's your third place, Indians. Now tied with the White Sox, 11 and a half games back of the Twins. Todd, at John June 3rd, 2019, the Cleveland Indians are below 500. What what is going on? This is this is awful. What's going on? This is reality. This this stems back. I can even go back as far as two off seasons ago, when the organization, the front office, ownership, just decided to stand pat and not do anything about the fact that they were in the middle of their championship window. And instead of adding to this great rotation and, and surrounding it with, you know, more star players and making moves to, to get more bats, they just decided, well, we'll sit here and, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, Frankie Lindor is a superstar and J Ram is a superstar and hopefully everybody else will fall into place. And some of these young guys will take the next step. And, uh, that has not happened as we've seen, especially this year. Uh, you know, last year was more of a, um, the division was terrible, so it didn't really matter what happened. But this year, as we saw, as we, we've seen with the White Sox who are playing improved baseball, uh, the Minnesota Twins who watched as the Indians did nothing and sat there and added pieces and have now become the best uh, team in the American League. And, um, you know, the Indians, young guys are not doing what they're supposed to do. The stars outside of Carlos Santana and Frankie Lindor are doing nothing. And here you are, 29 and 30, an insane 11 and a half games out of first on June 3rd. And the talk now is, you know, do you start to trade pieces off? Which I can't believe we're having this conversation, but actually well, part of me can. Yeah, I know. It's very, it's very disappointing. And we're going to talk to Zach Meisel, our guest coming up today from TheAthletic.com, who wrote a very good piece about whether the team should buy, whether the team should sell, or even stand pat. Zach will join us uh, coming up in a little bit here on the Dairy Brothers Tribecast, which you're listening to on WaitingForNextYear.com and wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, uh, we're brought to you by our friends at Groove Ride, a great place to work out. Todd will tell you about all three locations in a second. Uh, we also got to bring up the fact that there was some positives this week. Zach Plesak pitched well in two starts. This poor kid gets no run support in Boston, no run support in Chicago, has had to face two very good lineups with the Red Sox and the White Sox. And, oh, by the way, kid, your next start will be against the Yankees. So enjoy that. Uh, I have some numbers, some damning numbers on the Indians cleanup hitter. Uh, we'll talk about Tito. Where is Bobby Bradley and why isn't he here? And again, Zach Meisel will join us um, coming up. But as Todd mentioned, 29-30, uh, and 30, very disappointing a week because it started off Pretty well. I mean, I think we expected the Indians to go to Fenway and lose the first game. And then it's like, ah, well, now they're going to push Chris Sale back to Thursday against the Yankees. So the Indians have a shot on Wednesday. Could they somehow beat David Price Tuesday, which they didn't really beat David Price. They beat the Boston bullpen. But, you know, they had some momentum, dude, going into Chicago. And then, you know, the White Sox the first two nights just absolutely clubbed them. And that game on Friday where the Indians basically booted the ball all over the stadium and and, and, and wet their pants was, was disgusting. One of the worst performances I've seen by the Indians in a long time. You, you could probably say that that was the worst and laziest performance by a Tito Francona managed team in you know since he took over in, in 2013. I want to go back further in the week to the Boston series where the Indians in uh, you know they got smoked. That first game on uh, Memorial Day, twelve to five, and you're like, "Oh boy, you know, here we go. We're just going to continue playing bad baseball." Get into that second game of the series. Uh, Zach Plesac pitched into the sixth, and only given up four hits, one earned run. You know, he was going pitch for pitch with David Price, who was obviously dominating the Indians through. Uh, he, he he went six innings and gave up no runs on three hits, and it just seemed like. Hey, uh, Zach, welcome to the Indians. You're going to pitch great, and by the way, no one's going to score any runs for you, so get used to it. But then the Indians made that very improbable comeback, scoring two in the eighth, 
and then you know to to to, to cut it to a one run game, but then. The Red Sox scored two in the bottom of the eighth, and you thought to yourself, up oh, at 5-2, the Indians can't score three runs in a game, let alone in an inning. And uh, they ended up batting around in the ninth, scoring five runs against uh, um, the closer by committee, Ryan Brazier. Um, and the Indians, it just Greg Allen hit a home run, Roberto Perez hit a home run. It was a wild ninth inning. Where that that literally, and then Brad Hand comes in, saves the game, and you think to yourself, "Wow, we, you and I both stayed up for it past midnight with that long rain delay." And I thought to myself, "Now, if there's ever a jumping off point, if you go back to a year before, it was actually um, the year year to the, it was 366 days later, so a year and a day later was this game." If you go back, it was when the Indians ended up coming back from that 8-3 to three ninth inning deficit against the Astros. Right. And an extra innings on a Greg Allen walk-off homer. Greg Allen had another big homer in this game. And you thought, last year that was the jump-off point to where the Indians took off. Could this be the jump-off point where the Indians will kick it into the next gear? And we go into Wednesday, and they go off and win 14-9. to nine, And you're like, all right, this is good. Momentum. And like you said, we go into Chicago – and lose three of four? I mean, what is that? And, and the first two games in Chicago were, were pathetic. And we talked about Friday, like you said. That that had Actaball written all over it. If you recall, when, when Manny was running the squad and refused to ever go out and, and argue plays with umpires to have the players' backs, and we knew that, that players were pissed about this, um, then they would not give effort. That, 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 had, that was what Friday kind of looked like. I mean... I'm sorry, but I can't believe that Tito would put Greg Allen back in the lineup the next day after he, you know, lollipopped a couple of throws into the cutoff. I mean, his effort sucked. Uh, and it's not just Greg Allen. It was everybody. Guys on the infield. The Mike Freeman experience on Friday at third base. Uh, he he has to play once in a while. I get that you have to play your utility guy once in a while, but I want to never, ever see him at third base again. Um, and it just, you know... Yesterday, Plesak pitched his ass off. I know Giolito's been great, and uh, man, oh man, he's probably going to be an all-star. He's, he's, his ERA's under three. He's been fantastic, but some of the at-bats, and you, know, there's, you mentioned Jose Ramirez popping out again to short and to third, back to being jumpy after what appeared to be a day off that was going to work for him to come back and, and swing the bat pretty well, but bottom line is still his, his numbers are bad, and you know there's this giant, there's this giant black hole with this lineup once you get through Lindor, Mercado, and Santana, it's it, it's there's not much else there. And you and I talked before we we hit record on this thing. The White Sox have some studs. Their lineup is chock full of studs. Tim Anderson's a stud. Moncada is a stud. Abreu's already been a stud. Uh, you know, I'm not saying Josh Cordell or whatever his name is or is a stud, but like he made plays. You know, the Lori Garcia has become a pretty good leadoff man, hitting over 300. So. That's a problem. There's just not enough there. And, you know, to me, the next move, and we'll ask Zach about it, the next move is on Tuesday night, we, we should be seeing Bobby Bradley in this lineup. How can you not? The guy's got 17 bombs in Columbus, and all he does is hit home runs. He's ready. I Well, a couple of things. You know, you mentioned Mike Freeman. You know, we shouldn't be bitching about the 25th man on the roster, but the roster construction is so poor they're carrying way too many relief pitchers for a team that the, the starting pitching is its strength. I mean, yesterday was a prime example when uh, Tito had to pinch hit uh, for Leonis Martin. I'm sorry, it was it was it was it was two moves in one, which basically emptied the bench. It was in the he pinch ran eighth inning, right? Yes, I believe it was the eighth inning. Roberto Perez gets a one out single off of. Um, Lucas Giolito, who has been dominant this year and dominated the Indians again. And Rick Renteria, Mr. Overmanaging himself, came out of the dugout and uh, lifted Giolito. And I thought it was doing the Indians a huge favor, going to a left-hander to face Leonis Martin, which obviously we knew that Tito would then counter with Jordan Luplo, whose one job on this team is to hit left-handed uh, pitching. He also, because Roberto was so slow and it was a one nothing game, he pinch-ran Mike Freeman. In that move right there, because Freeman obviously can't catch, Ploiecki has to come in and catch, Luplo replaces Martin, there's nobody left on the bench. You have three bench players. How many relief pitchers do we really need? Do we need 
four left-handed right. relievers in I, the bullpen. I love when they bring Ty, I love when they bring Tyler Clippard into games. I'm like, oh, he's on our team. I forgot we even had him. That's so funny that you say that because the last time I saw Clippard, whenever I think about the Indians' pen and who they're going to bring in and stuff, it's like Clippard doesn't exist in my mind for some reason. I don't know why, but I thought the same thing when he came. I was like, oh, I forgot he was even out there. But it just it makes no sense. You you eliminated your entire bench in one at bat. So that's neither here nor there. My, Mike Freeman blows. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. Again, we shouldn't be bitching about the 25th man, but the fact that you could have had Mike Freeman came over on a, uh, um, a minor league deal. You know who else got a minor league deal? Derek Dietrich. Dietrich. I, I know. Let's, yeah. Can we not have that conversation? But, but I saw a piece. Stop. It was just like a, a quick blurb on, on MLB trade rumors that Scooter Jeanette, who was an all-star last year for the Reds, is going to be coming back soon. And um, David Bell, the manager, had said, well, we're going to play Scooter every day. He's a proven guy, but it doesn't matter because we'll find room for Derek Dietrich because of his versatility, because he can play so many different positions plus the outfield. And I'm thinking to myself, you know who would look really good on the bench? Somebody who can play multiple positions, uh, infield and outfield, and have power like that. Wouldn't that have been nice? Uh, it, it's a it's a mind-blowing situation where the winter went on, we talked about making a trade for him. Call the Marlins and give them, give year, you know, absolutely. you know, give a, give them, give them a Davis Bakery sandwich. Throw in the pickle and the cookie. Who fucking cares? Okay, do that and get Derek Dietrich. Then he gets released, DFA or whatever. I think he was just flat out released by the Marlins. And they don't pick up his contract. They, they non-tendered him. Non-tendered. So that's a lock. The kid went to Ignatius. He's from Cleveland. I know he's a left-handed bat. Who cares? He plays a lot of different positions. He's versatile, which is what Tito loves. It's a no-brainer. You add him on a minor league deal, and if he works out, you pay him $2 million. No, 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 but we had to pay Danny 4 and a half, Cargo 2, Hanley 1. I will run that $7.5 million out of reset till I'm blue in the face. It just made no sense. Derek Dietrich was not going to cost you a lot of money, and he's from here. That, 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 that's a good bit, the uh, 7.5. Uh, but but going back to the roster construction, um, you know the way things are right now. Uh, you and I have discussed this. I, I, I tweeted this during the week twice, and I know Leonis Martin is a nice guy, and it's a great story, and I couldn't be more happy for him that he is healthy again. But save for that big bomb he hit on Saturday, the guy has been an absolute zero for the last six weeks. He doesn't. He doesn't make contact. He strike. He, wait, he's fourth in the American League in strikeouts, and he swings so hard, and it's it, and he's fooling nobody. Okay, the guy's hitting two sixteen uh, with a with an on base percent or, uh, o, OPS of six forty nine. Okay, he struck out sixty three times already this year in one hundred ninety four at bats. I, I would say that. The, he's, he's clearly not a part of the future. He's 31 years old. Yes, he's a nice defensive player, but at this point, there's no reason to keep him around. So my plan is as follows for right now. Naquin is supposed to be activated tomorrow, to, which is Tuesday. Naquin? So Naquin's coming back. As much, to, much to my chagrin, Naquin is coming back. The plan should be this. Leonis Martin should be DFA'd. You could have... Jake Bowers playing left with mixing in Greg Allen. Center field should be Oscar Mercado every single day against right-handed pitching and left-handed pitching. Just leave him there. And if you want to give him a day off once a week, play Greg Allen. Right field can platoon of Naquin and Luplo until <coughs> further notice, until the Bradley Zimmer situation comes around. And yesterday on the broadcast, I heard Andre not say that he had a minor setback and he has not gotten to Columbus yet. So he, I don't think you'll see him until the all after the All Star break. That should be your outfield, and Bobby Bradley should come up and DH every single day, mix him in once a week at first base with Carlos. I know that Bowers and you, just, and you send and you send one and you send one of these relievers down that you don't need. That, or... that was, yeah, that's what I was going to say. You, have, you you don't need Josh Smith. We don't need four left-handed relievers. It's ridiculous. Uh, so you get rid of one of the relievers, bring up Bradley. Let this guy, let the kid rake, and let's see what he's got. It couldn't hurt. No. Nobody else is hitting. Why not? When, when, and I will segue this into you, and, and I know that this is where you want to go. We are currently, our cleanup situation is against lefties, Jordan Luplo, and against righties, uh, uh, Jason Kipnis. Okay? Correct. That can't happen. No. I'm sorry. We're, that's not, that's. 
that's not a contending team. And, you know, you could say, you know, I know the lineup, is, you know, it's different and people don't view the cleanup spot like it used to. It's still a run producing spot. And you have two guys in there who aren't run producers or uh, don't even pretend to be. So it just doesn't make much sense to me at all. Bring up Bobby Bradley. And when he's ready, hit him clean up. I don't care. Why not? Right. Or some Kipnis. No. And, and then here's the thing about Jason. All right. You love Jason Kipnis, early 30s, 32. Uh, on the last year of his deal, and this is it for him. And you got to respect what he has done as an Indian. He's been a classy, terrific uh, uh, representative uh, of wearing the chief or wearing the C. But it's over. And you know, I'm not. I'm not sitting here telling you that I think this organization is going to DFA him or try to move him. I'm not sure who's going to take him. But him hitting in the four hole or the two hole is a joke. He had another 0 for four yesterday. You know, tying. He was the tying run at the plate. Bottom and the top of the ninth, uh, you know, against Colome, you knew the high heat was coming. You knew he wasn't catching up to it. The guy's OPS, which we love to use on this show, uh, on base percentage plus slugging. Jason Kipnis's OPS is 603. You want some research? Here we go. There are players around baseball that fan bases want benched on their teams. There's tons of them. Brandon Crawford, listen to San Francisco Sports Talk. Talk, uh, peruse the internet and see what fans think of Brandon Crawford in San Francisco. He's a World Series champion shortstop, but he's been finished for the last couple years hitting. His OPS is 618, higher than Kipnis's of 603. Brian Dozier, a shell of himself in Washington, having a horrible year, has an OPS of 697, still higher than the Kipnis 603. Jesus Aguilar Todd, and you know this, fluky year last year, right? I, I tweeted out his stats uh, this week. Horrible. Guys, if a Jose Ramirez type fall off the table. Totally. All right. Can't hit. Has been benched by Milwaukee and hitting a paltry 196. But his OPS 607 is still higher than Kipnis. Curtis Granderson recently benched by the Marlins. Hitting under 200. OPS 652. Do I have to tell you who that's higher than? You get the picture. Delano DeShields benched in Texas. Does, now just comes off the bench. 605 OPS. Still higher than Kipnis. I mean, should I go into Jose Iglesias, who was picked up like in, in, in April by the Reds because they needed him? Because uh, um, who got hurt for the Reds? Uh, was it Peraza or one of the other? Who's the other shortstop uh, that got hurt for the Reds? I don't remember. Some, I think maybe Jeanette got hurt, so they moved Peraza to second. Whatever it was, Jose Iglesias OPS is 762. And here in Detroit, where I live, Jacoby Jones, okay, who cannot hit and actually has been hitting lately, still has a 730 on base percentage plus slugging to Kipnis' 603. I mean, come on. 603? I just named you some real shit in that line and on that on that list. And and, and Kipnis's numbers are all lower than, than these guys. That's you know, it's unacceptable. And if Tito can't move him and the team can't move him and he has to play. Don't bat him fourth. I don't know why he's batting fourth. Why on earth is he hitting fourth? I I, I will always look back. There, there, there's two guys in particular who I think have caught a ton of shit over the last two years that I think time will heal that those wounds with Indians fans. And in five years or even three years, you will look back differently. One is Josh Tomlin because I, – I, listen, Josh Tomlin is what he is, but – Without Josh Tomlin, that team does not get to Game 7 of the World Series. Correct. And I will love him. For oh, yeah. No, no, no. He was unbelievable in the but, in the 2016 you know, playoffs. Last year when he was giving up 8,000 home runs and everyone was, you know, ranting and raving about how terrible he is and get him off the team and yada, yada, yada. I mean, listen, rightfully so. But in the end, he's gone one year and I, and, and I think people have softened on him. And I think people will soften on Kip over time as well. He's – it's listen, is he as good as he was – three years ago of course not he's, he's not the same player but it's not his fault that the Indians are, have been forced to put him into this position because the lineup and the roster is so bad I mean in the end when he signed that contract extension it was a, for a six year contract extension don't tell me at the time you didn't love it because everybody did they were like sure. great we locked him up long term no I'm not I'm not you know, I'm not mad at the contract. Okay, right. This no. is what you get at the end of these contracts. This is how it works. So yes, do I want him do I do I like him making seventeen million? Is it no? Is it a gigantic elephant on top of the organization's back? Yes. But Tito's not putting him in a good position to succeed. Correct. If he was hitting seventh or eighth, I don't think we would care.
player nearly as much, but he keeps putting him second and fourth, which which is the main problem. You know, it, it is the main problem, and I don't I don't want to sound like I'm picking on him, but the numbers are the numbers, and you've got to do better than six oh three if you're hitting fourth. It's you're right; it's not all his fault. He can't lay off that high fastball anymore. He hit some balls hard all, all, all over the weekend. I will give him that, and they were run down by. Everybody, it seemed like, in right field made diving catches. Tilson, Cordell, all those guys made plays uh, against Kipnis, who hit the ball pretty hard. All right, we're going to hear from Todd about Groove Ride, our sponsor. Then Zach Meisel is going to join us from the Athletic.com covers the tribe. But uh, first, Todd has a, a very important message about some very important people. Do you want to, me to do this now? Or go for it. Zach? No, go for it. Okay. Zosimo and Anjua, who own Groove Ride, the three locations I've told you about many times, are a great couple. They came here with a dream and a goal of starting a small business and really immersing themselves in the Cleveland community. And they have done that at Groove Ride. And I've said this many times, it's it's not just you know, a place you can go to spin or a place you can go to boot camp or boxing or, or yoga or bar. It is a real family community and atmosphere in there. Uh, I work out at both the Woodmere and Van Aken locations um, doing different things. I take yoga at Van Aken, which is great. And then I also obviously do boot camp and spinning at Woodmere. The teachers are all A plus, um, just the nicest people. Great deals there going on. The classes are relatively inexpensive when you compare them to other places around town. And again, each of the three locations has something different um, depending on where you live and depending on what you're looking for. So the downtown locations across from Perk Park there near Reserve Square, uh, the, the, the Van Aken location, which is its newest, uh, right there at Shaker and Warrensville. And then you have the Woodmere on Chagrin Boulevard in Brainerd above the old mattress firm space. Come check them out, GrooveRide.com, G-R-O-O-V-E-R-Y-D-E.com, and tell them I sent you. And our guest today here on the Dairy Brothers Tribecast, as promised, he does a fantastic job covering the Indians for TheAthletic.com. Also, he used to work at Cleveland.com. It's our buddy, Zach Meisel. Hey, Zach. It's an honor to join you guys. Oh, boy. I don't know about that. How about that? <laughs> All right. We'll take it. What, uh, how was Chicago? Uh, let me put the whole road trip in this context. Like, every time you go on, the team goes on one of these week-long things, you you get back and it feels like you were gone for a month. And in a season like this, they feel like a year. I mean, it's it's the games have just dragged. It's been I don't want to start off on such a negative foot here. Sorry, go but for it. The games the games all season have dragged, and it's been such a boring, painful brand of baseball to watch that like I, I, it it takes so much out of you. And I'm sure it's like that for any fan who is is diehard enough to tune in every day as you guys are. It's, it's, it's really tough. And, you know, I I was joking recently, um, the calendar finally flipped from May to June and it was like a sigh sigh of relief because I I had been saying like, man, the season feels like it's been dragging for so long and it's only May. Well, now at least it's June. That's like a little bit closer to, when things are going to start to have to happen one way or the other. So we'll get some excitement. Uh, but it's, it's, it's been rough. It's just been so difficult to watch. There's no consistency. There's no, you know, it's just not enjoyable. And, you know, I feel for the fans who, you know, suffer through the off season and are just excited to get to opening day. And it's like, Hey, now at least we have baseball we can watch for the next six months. And I don't know if, if this is what you're open to watch. It's, it's funny because, you know, I am a season ticket holder. You get paid to watch this. I actually spend money to watch this garbage <laughs> and choose to do so. So I'm the real problem, I suppose. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I To be honest, I don't know how somebody can sit through this season the way that Matt and I do and not be frustrated. If you had to put your finger on the one thing that has been the most frustrating from an organizational standpoint, what what would you say that would be? Ooh, it's so hard to just pinpoint one thing because I think a lot of things almost play off of each other. Um, 
I, I think it's just the, the one thing I can't get. Well, there's more than one thing. A couple things I can't get over. One is, I, I mean, you could have asked anyone who's ever attended a Cleveland Indians game, what are the glaring weaknesses on this roster? Going back even even to the offseason before last, and they would have pointed to the outfield. They would have pointed to holes in the lineup. Like it's it's something everyone could see, and yet it, it went unaddressed. And it's it kind of boggles my mind because, look, the front office has a really good track record. They've had some some critical mistakes the last couple of years, but they're smart people, and then they saw this. They knew, you know, what has happened was a possibility. And so that, and then I don't want to sit here and just rail on ownership in the front office all the time. And, and you guys have done a good job contextualizing this all season. But, you know, it's just it, something doesn't add up. And, you know, my, I mean, my sit down from Dolan with Dolan from the spring, like, replays in my head almost every day because just the message to the fan base was so poor over the off season in general, not just with his comments, but right. just right. how things unfolded. And, you know, in a season when you have the all-star game and, you know, you, you want to like the fan base is the lifeblood of this franchise. And, and you're saying that you need good attendance. You need the extra financial boost. And yet what you do and, and the decisions you make are not going to attract anyone to the ballpark. And you left open this, this you're, you're vulnerable to a 29 and 30 start and, you know, a big deficit in the division and, and a, a season that now you might have to be a seller and you might have to punt on 2019, like that you left the door open for that to happen. And so how did you expect, how do you expect fans to just, you know, embrace this and, and come down to the ballpark? And it's just, it, it never added up to me. And I would have loved to be a fly in the wall in some of those meetings over the off season, not just on the baseball side of things, but the business side. And to say like, you know, was there someone saying, hey, you know, if we do this and it doesn't go well, like, are we going to then have to cut 30 million more in payroll next season? Are we going to have to start trading some of these guys before they get to arbitration? Like, it's, it's a slippery slope. And I just it, it has never added up to me. And I, I don't understand why this had to be the course of action. Zach Meisel, Athletic.com, uh, with us here on the Dairy Brothers Tribecast. Uh, Todd's going to ask you in a second about your article, which was very, very good, that I just read this morning about the future and, and the future for, of 2019. I want to go back to Jose Ramirez. How much of this is him? And how how his struggles now are almost going on a, a full year. But if he's hitting and if he's being himself from 16 to 18, how much different would this season look? I think it would look a little different, but I, I think – there's still ways. I mean, Carlos Santana was as hot as can be for April, but like you can pitch around a guy when he's the only guy hitting in the lineup. So I, I don't know. I mean, maybe you can have a couple more wins, but it, it's that's if you're talking Todd's first question, like on the field organizational issues. That's that that's number one. I mean, he's the guy because if, if you if you think about the future. And you're thinking about, all right, like, you feel pretty comfortable with the pitching side. You know, if they trade Trevor Bauer, well, at least they still have Clevenger and Bieber. Carrasco are locked up long term. Plesak looks like he could be something special. Jeffrey Rodriguez has shown flashes. So, like, there's, there's, they have a ton of really intriguing relief arms in the minors. Like, I, I feel confident with the pitching side moving forward three, the next three, four, five, six years. But you look at the position player side, and it's like, all right, well, Lindor is the big elephant in the room. You're going to have to figure out what to do there at some point. Um, like Oscar Mercado has been, been fun to watch so far. Daniel Johnson and Bobby Bradley should get a shot here at some point, but like, who are your building blocks? And it's like, do you still, are you confident you can build around Jose Ramirez for the next four or five years? He signed, he's under team control through 2023. Like, is that a good thing? Like, is, is he the guy you want hitting third for the foreseeable future? I don't know the answer to that anymore. And that's that's kind of the scary thing is this was supposed to be your rock. This was supposed to be the guy who even after Lindor goes to greener pastures, you would have and he'd be hitting in the middle of your lineup. And now I, I don't know what to make of him. I think a lot of his struggles are mental. It's him trying to do too much to conquer what pitchers are the adjustments they're making to him. So it's – it's tough, and, and I don't know the solutions. And it, you know, if there were simple solutions, they would have been made by now. 
you, you laid out in your piece this morning the basically the three scenarios, which are buy, sell, or hold, or both, actually. Um, if you were the general manager, which route would you take? Uh, I know for me, if I were running things, I would kind of sit in the middle. I would definitely trade Trevor Bauer uh, and and see what I could get for him. But you know, you also laid out in there the, the the trade pieces that the Indians have, and it doesn't seem like there's that many great options out there of people that you would be comfortable trading. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there, I get a lot of people who say, all right, time for the rebuild, time for the teardown, no. fire sale. Yeah, that, that's, that's not what this is. Um, to do that, you'd be trading Bauer, Hand, Lindor, and then Carrasco and Clevenger and, and those guys. Like, that's that's not what, uh, barring some seismic change in, in plans here, that's not going to happen. And that, honestly, if they did that, you want to just talked about the message to the fan base. Well, that's... That's telling fans come back in five years if this goes well, and and that's I don't know if that's going to work in Cleveland. So, I, I, their plan all along, and we kind of saw hints of it this off season was they and we heard the term thread the needle a million times, but they they wanted to get from point A to point B, being like point A was the Kipnis Kluber Gomes Brantley regime to point B, which is building around. Clevenger, Bieber, Jose Ramirez, and and these minor leaguers that they have because their their farm system is going to be top ten probably next year and maybe even like top five the year after that. They have some some really really good talent in the lower levels, so they wanted to get from one point to the other without having that rebuild era where they lose ninety five games for three or four years, and it's possible to do that. You just have to cash in on your aging assets before it's too late. It's why we all sit here now, and I think everyone has jumped to the side of, man, they really should have moved Kluber when they had the chance over the offseason. I think because of that, yeah, I would trade Trevor Bauer. I would listen on offers for Brad Hand and Carlos Santana. And, you know, all the the little veterans like Kevin Ploiecki and Oliver Perez, Leonis Martin, if someone wants them, they can take them. Um, but other than that, like I, I'd be keeping my eye out for pieces that are under control for multiple years. So if the Mariners want to make Domingo Santana available, I'd throw them an offer. If there are other teams out there who have younger pieces who they might move, I'd keep my eyes open. So I, I, it, it's selling, but it's, it's not going to be a deep sell. And I'd still, if, if, the trade is right like i think i would try to buy too because i think there is a way to contend in 2020 and 2021 and then maybe you don't have to move francisco lindor um but it that that's it, it's all interwoven and it's complex and it, it depends on what other teams are willing to do you know the interesting thing that i haven't seen too many people talk about yet is there's only one trade deadline this year right you know, the august the august waiver period is over so uh, teams are going to have to make that decision and, and jump to the buyer side or the seller side a, a little earlier than normal, I think. And then also, like <laughs> once you do that, you're you're pretty much stuck. Once once you commit one way or the other, um, you only have till July 31st. So it'll be interesting to see if maybe teams start trading earlier than normal, and, and if the Indians have to make some decisions a bit sooner than they would have hoped. I have a follow up on, on, on the trades. Kluber, you, you mentioned your piece, and, and I think people don't realize it. I think they just assume that he's under contract for the next two years. These are club options at 16 and $17 million over the next two years, and I, I, I have no doubt that they would pick it up for next year. I don't know about in two years. Um, how far, how close do you think they were to dealing Kluber? I, Matt and I were always on the side of he's going in the wrong direction. He's on the wrong side of 30. If you're going to try to cut payroll, you have the depth there. That's the guy you should have traded during the or this off season, which they ended up not doing. Do you think the offers just weren't good enough or how, how far down the line do you think they actually got with doing it? I think they got pretty far with the Dodgers. It's, it's always tough to tell because you get people have agendas. And so you never know how truthful you're being when you hear information, especially during like the winter meetings season. Um, I, I think they got, like, there were plenty of talks. And the other thing is that the winter meetings, too, when 
seem to be the height of these talks. Um, there's so much that there's so much bullshit out there, and, and are we allowed to swear on this podcast? Yes. Okay. Oh, it's uh, then, it's been done multiple multiple times already today because I you know because of the frustration. <laughs> As you heard last week, Matt was dropping multiple f bombs. He was so upset. Yeah, I'm not I'm not proud of it, but uh, go ahead, Zach. Sorry. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, I think they got pretty far along. You know, the thing that's it's so much easier to say now, obviously, because we got a glimpse of Kluber in 2019, and and also the rise of Shane Bieber. Um, so I remember talking in the off season to some people from other teams and just asking like, Hey, if, if they flip Kluber for a young position player, what's that going to do for their outlook? Is their rotation going to be okay? And I had a couple people tell me like Shane Bieber is the real deal and teams are high on him. He's got a lot of potential. And so they said, you know, it wouldn't be as long as you've got a good offensive piece that could help you immediately it wouldn't be a dramatic drop off necessarily because they believed in Bieber. And that made me, that that pushed me completely to the side of, all right, well, they should make this move now before it's too late, cash in on him. And, and, you know, they didn't do it. And now it's, it's easy to say that would have been the right move. Assuming they got, you know, the deal, something along the lines that we had heard of, you know, Alex Verdugo and another piece, something like that. Uh, It's easy to say now, but boy, you just imagine what the outlook of this team would be like had they make made that move, and I think everybody would have been satisfied. Zach Meisel, Athletic.com, joining us here. Dairy Brothers Tribecast on a Monday. Indians will be back at it tomorrow on Tuesday against the Twins for three and then the Yankees. Uh, what about Tito? How is he handling everything? You're in that clubhouse with him every day, and obviously you're not behind closed doors, but close enough. Uh, how's he handling everything? Is, is there a disconnect between him and the front office? Because now he's being forced to play kids, which has never been his thing. Where do you think this all stands with the manager at this point? You know, I'll be honest. I think at times he's sounded a bit defeated, a bit unlike his normal self, because he's usually a positive guy who says, let's turn the page, show up to the ballpark every day, not caring about what happened in the past, because it truly doesn't matter. And he's... I mean, he's voiced that same message a lot this year because it's been so necessary for these guys to hear it. But I think I think it's been a struggle. I mean, it, it's – I don't think there's a – you know, I think a lot of fans – I see this a lot on Twitter. First of all, Tito receives a ton of criticism. Ton, some of it's warranted. Some of it – I think people are just looking for a scapegoat here. Um, I don't think it's necessarily that, like, he hates young kids and, and only trusts veterans – Haley Ramirez and Carlos Gonzalez did not have exactly long stints here. And it's not like Tito was begging the front office, like, you got to keep these guys and give them 300 at bats. And it didn't happen like that. And it's, believe me, if there was a solution at second base, if Yu Chang had been healthy all season and was hitting really well, I'm not so sure Jason Kipnis would be hitting fourth every day or be in the lineup at all. I mean, it's, it's just, part of it is that there's just no one to replace him. So I think I think this has taken a bit of a toll on Tito. I think it's been difficult. Um, and it's just, it's something new. And it's something he hasn't really had to deal with in Cleveland. You know, it, it, the season kind of reminds me of 2015 in some ways. Um, so I guess they kind of went through it then. But at that point, they hadn't had the success in the previous years that they've had now. So it's just, it's different, and I think they're all trying to figure out, you know, what to do with this season to set themselves up best for the future. I think everybody realizes you got to play the kids. you got to let Mercado get the growing pains out. you got to let Plesak learn how to pitch up here. So those are, the, those are kind of the new goals that they're going to monitor for the rest of the season, and, you know, it's quite a change from the last few years. I have one last question for you, and – it goes to the, the coaching staff. It seems as though, you know, obviously we've seen with Tito and his obsession with bunting, which you know, <laughs> drives, me, it drives me insane, but the staff is a collection of old school baseball thinkers where the game has become more progressive and you're still seeing the Indians bunt guys over. Um, and it just seems like the, the front office wants to think one way and the coaching staff kind of thinks another. Uh do you think there'll be any staff changes at any point over, you know, I know Tito 
still signed the extension. But to me, I think they need to get some sort of a uh, different, younger approach on that staff. I mean, the young guy on the staff, essentially, at this point is, is still Sandy. And, you know, Sandy played in the 90s. So uh, do, do you think there'll be any staff changes if, if things go the way they have the rest of the season, maybe in the off season. Yeah, I'm glad you asked this because, and I'm not like, this isn't a critique on you, but I, I, I see this a lot. I don't think there's a, there's this disconnect between coaching staff and the front office that people just assume there is. Um, and yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, would they be bunting as much as they do? Look, I've tweeted in the past as much as anyone, how much I hate bunting. And I, I, will never support it unless it's like the backup catcher bunting with runners on first and second, nobody out, and you're tied in the ninth. Right in the, in the late in, in the late innings, yes, not not in the second maybe, inning. Maybe, but but I haven't even really commented on it this season because this lineup is so pathetic as it is that like if they don't bunt, if they do bunt, I don't even know if it's going to make a difference. I mean, it's. It's so bad, and it's brutal to watch either way. If anything, it speeds the game up. But I think they have done – a lot of teams have done this where they hire, like, these 30-year-old people who have worked for Driveline or other companies like that, and they become basically just, like, consultants or um, roving coordinators where – you know, they'll go watch guys all throughout the minors and they'll communicate with the coaching staffs there just to get more of like an analytical or video based take on how to approach things. And they, they do this at the major league level too. Like Brian Sweeney is on the coaching staff. No one knows who he is. He's like, I don't even know what his technical position is. Um, but he's basically like Carl Willis and Scott Atchison's like assistants. And he does everything with those guys. He's a young guy. He's like four, in his lower 40s, I think. And it's he, he plays that role where he's he's looking at a lot of video and he's breaking things down like you would hope a younger coaching staff would. And they have, like they hired a guy, I think his name's Cody Buckle, who was working at Driveline. And he's like been all over the place just helping the pitchers from that more – analytical and science-based background and and um you know it's interesting like they send front office members on the road to every trip like eric binder is a guy who has known trevor bauer and, and has the same type of brain when it comes to pitching as trevor bauer and he's meeting with the coaching staff uh before every game and and giving them like here's what our analytics people think we should do to approach this game tonight and then you know, you, you confer with the coaching staff and you come up with a plan and you take it to the players. And so it's 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 not as simple as a, a lot of people want to make it out to be where it's like, all right, you want the front office wants to do things just like the Astros and the Rays and the coaching staff wants to do things like the 70s and the 80s. Like it's not it's not so cut and dry like that. And it really is a collaboration. And all of that said, should there be some changes based on how this season has gone? I, I think so. I mean, I. Ty Van Berkleyo is a really nice guy. I never know how much criticism to place on a hitting coach or a pitching coach because, like, they're working with everybody, and a lot of it has to fall on the player. And in this case, a lot of it has to fall on the front office and ownership too. And so I, I don't know if he deserves to lose his job, but, you know, might it help to have a new voice in there for next season? Yeah, it's possible. So I don't know that you can just – watch this season unfold and say, all right, let's bring the same exact group back and it'll be fine. Um, so it's possible there are some changes maybe going into next year, but I don't think this is a dire situation where it's like, man, you need to clean out the staff and hire all 35 year olds so that they can get along with the front office and, and execute the plan that they should. I think it's more collaborative than people realize. Um, and, and honestly, at the end of the day, it's, you look at this roster and it's like, I mean, they, they shouldn't be any better than 29 and 30. We've seen Mike Freeman playing like every other day. Oh, We've gosh. seen, yeah. So it, it's, can't take it anymore. it's just the situation that they're in, I think. All right. Well, last, last question. Uh, this Bobby Bradley situation. Uh, what are the, what's the percent chance he's in the lineup tomorrow? And, and, and they move, they get him up here already. Wow. Um, I think, I think he'll be up here before long. I mean, it seems like the guy hits a home run every day. 
And he said something. He said a bunch to like the opposite field. Yeah. Like he seems like a more complete hitter than he has in the past. He's he's certainly the next domino. Um, it's it's going to be interesting because Naquin will probably return tomorrow. I would think they're making the decision on him today, and so you're going to have to cut somebody as it is. I'm you know Jake Bowers is interesting because it seems like every time when you can peg him as like you know what he needs a trip to Triple A. I've seen enough of him for now. It's like he, he always does like just the bare minimum enough to to keep his job. Maybe maybe he'll get a trip back to Columbus. Maybe Leonis Martin's time is dwindling down. But yeah, I mean it, it's it's time having Bobby Bradley like his only negative is that he strikes out a lot. And in this lineup, like who cares? Right. They need they need power. <laughs> they need they need a threat in the middle of the lineup. But enough of Kipnis hitting fourth. Enough oh. of. You know, when Mike Freeman's in the lineup, he's been hitting like second or sixth. The guy's career average is like 165. Like, enough of that. Um, and I know there aren't great alternatives on this roster, but still. So, yeah, I, I don't know if it'll be as soon as tomorrow, but I, there's no reason Bobby Bradley should not be up at some point this month, right? Zach, I think we're with you lockstep on, on, on that. And we talked before you came on about Kipnis hitting fourth and, and the OPS and how low it is. and. Uh, you bring up a lot of great points. Hang in there, brother. I, I, it, it can only go up from here, right? Yeah, and I mean, I, it's look. I I, it, I apologize every time I do an interview now because I don't want to sound so negative. And even if this season doesn't go as planned, and it seems like it's certainly not going to, there are things that you can watch and appreciate. And it's been, you know, Oscar Mercado has had some growing pains and he's made some mistakes. He's been really fun to watch. And, you know, Plesak, his two starts have been incredible. And there are going to be some kids who get called up whether the season turns around or not, like James Karinchek at AAA, who I can't wait to see. The kid throws 98, strikes everybody out, doesn't give up hits. Nick Sandlin is a kid they drafted last year who maybe can be a September call-up, a really intriguing reliever. So, like, there, there are things to get excited about and to appreciate. It's just tough right now, I think, because – no one knows the direction of the team. And if you're a long-time diehard Indians fan who, you know, has has been waiting for 2016 and 2017 and 2018 to come along and you finally get it and you get that taste and you get so close and yet it doesn't pan out how you want it to and then you start to see things turn the other way, it's just, it's got to be killer. And so hopefully, you know, hopefully there are still some brighter days ahead and Maybe 2019 just needs to be that retooling season to get things back on track. All right, Zach, appreciate the time, man. We uh, we love talking to you. All right, you got it, guys. Keep up the good work. All right, Zach Meisel, there he is from theathletic.com, joining us here. Uh, appreciate his time. Lots, lots of good insight, Todd. And, and, you know, Zach trying to calm us down a little bit, but but he's right. It's it's It looks like, at least for this season, it's, it's off the rails. But I, I agree with you and him. If they were to trade Trevor Bauer, I'm not trading Brad Hand, by the way, but if they're trading Trevor Bauer, that doesn't mean this is a rebuild and they're starting over, not at all. I'm not trading Hand either, especially with the control you have of him. I, I thought the most interesting stuff from Zach, who, he had a ton of great stuff, but the coaching staff insight was really good. I mean, I didn't know a lot of that, and that was very informative. So I, I, I think, you know, when when people like me and, you know, others have these preconceived notions of how the staff is, and they're they're all one way 1970s, 1980s thinking. Like you said, there are guys behind the scenes that are are kind of mixing it in. I thought that was the analytical stuff. I, I thought that was great, but you know, awesome that Zach, we had Zach on and uh, a good follow up to his piece in the Athletic that everyone should read today. They should, and you know, we asked him about about bringing Bobby Bradley up. Here's the thing, and maybe one of the reasons why the Indians will not do this, Todd, is is the Twins come in on Tuesday. We see Devin Smeltzer, a left-handed rookie pitcher for the Twins, on Tuesday, and then Wednesday it's Martin Perez, who's had a good year again from the left side. So if you bring Bradley up now, he would have to face two lefties in a huge series. Whether people want to admit it or not, and they're eleven and a half back, and the division's probably done, but. If you're thinking this is the big, a big week, I don't remember who it was, if it was Hattery or one of those Let's Go Tribe guys or even Jeff Ellis tweeted out, this might be the biggest week of the season coming up with the Twins and Yankees, but the first two pitchers you're going to face, uh, Tuesday, Bieber against Smeltzer, Wednesday, Carrasco against Perez, and then Thursday's Bauer against Barrios. So you wouldn't see a righty until Thursday. And I'll tell you another thing. This weekend, um, I be- you'll see CeCe Sabathia, who's 
a left-hander also. They're missing Jay Happ, but um, the Yankees are going to be throwing Herman, Tanaka, and, and CeCe over the weekend. So that's another – you'll see three lefties this week. Hey, three lefties in seven games. Ugh. What's the over-under on the total amount of runs we'll score? It's been rough. I'm going to go with eight. Uh, this eight is... and a half. We'll set the over-under at those three games at eight and a half. This week could be rougher than Jared Kushner's interview on Axios. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that'll do. <laughs> I think we're done now. All right, uh, this has been another edition of WaitingForNextYear.com's edition of the Dairy Brothers Tribecast. We thank Craig and the crew at that great website. And, of course, GrooveRide, R-Y-D-E.com. If you're looking to work out and do something different to get yourself into shape, do what Todd does and get to a Groove Ride. All right, sir, uh, I know you're heading out of town for a little while, but uh, you'll be at the game tomorrow night, right? Uh, yes, I will be there tomorrow night to see the uh... – Devin Smeltzer, Shane Bieber. All right. Looking forward to it. Of course. All right, buddy. We'll uh, we'll talk next week. Thanks to Zach Meisel as well. This has been another edition of the Jerry Brothers Tribecast. See ya.